Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare in Context with Claire. The Comedy of Errors is a farcical play about confusion, misidentification and family life. It is thought to be one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. So, let's start with some dates. The Comedy of Errors was first published in the first folio of 1623. The first performance was recorded in the Gesta Graorum, published in 1688, from manuscripts recording the Prince of Purpool Festival over the Christmas period in 1594. On Innocent's Day, 28th December 1594, at Gray's Inn, a comedy of errors was played by the players. Many of Shakespeare's plays were performed in the inns of court. The play would have been easy to stage, as it respects the classical unities of time and place. All the action was in the market square in Ephesus on the same day. It is also the shortest play by Shakespeare, even though it is the shortest play. As well as being filled with rhyming verse and slapstick humour, it is packed with legal terms and concepts. You might even think that he was writing for law students. In the first 35 lines of the play, I have found 35 legal words. Proceed, Sir Linus, to procure my fall, and by the doom of death, end woes and all action. Merchant of Syracuse, plead no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which have late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants, our well-dealing countrymen, who wanting guilders to redeem their lives, have sealed his rigorous statues with their bloods, excludes all pity from our threatening looks. For since the mortal and intestine jars twixt dices dicious countrymen and us, it hath in solemn synods been decreed, both by the Syracusians and ourselves, to admit no traffic to our adverse towns. Nay more, if any born at Ephesus be seen at Syracusian marts and fairs, again, if any Syracusian born come to the Bay of Ephesus, he dies. His goods confiscate to the duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and to ransom him. Thy substance valued at the highest rate, cannot amount to a hundred marks. Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this my comfort, when your words are done, my woes end likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusian, say in brief the cause, why thou departest from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. A heavier task could not have been imposed, than I to speak my griefs unspeakable, yet that the world may witness that my end was wrought by nature, not by vile offence. I'll utter what my sorrow gives me leave. Here are some more words to play that are commonly used in the law courts. In 1577, a history of error was performed at Hampton Court by the children of St. Paul's. It is listed as Errors in Francis Mears' Pallardis Tamia, published in 1598. Errors is the nickname that the play was given after the performance on Innocence Night in 1594. Fifty years earlier, almost to the day, Menechmi was the first recorded classical drama to be presented at court. Cardinal Wolsey chose the play for presentation at Hampton Court on the 3rd of January 1527. Two years later, out of favour, he gave Hampton Court, otherwise known as Avon, from the Celtic Roman name Avon Dunham, to King Henry VIII. Henry had the Great Hall built circa 1535. Me is the main source play for the Comedy of Errors. The popular play by Plautus was widely available in the original Latin, but it wasn't published in England until 1595, 
after the first recorded performance of the Comedy of Errors. Minikmi, a pleasant and fine conceited comedy, taken out of the most excellent witty poet Plautus, chosen purposely from out the rest as least harmful and yet most delightful, written in English by Double V Double V. The printer's mark containing the, in the words the recit vulnere veritas is also seen on the famous victories of Henry V, fifteen ninety eight. It might be my imagination. The word vulnere looks like V V space E Vir. May be a bit tenuous, but de Vir is known to have signed himself V V, which reflects his motto Vero nihil various. If you're in any doubt that De Vere was connected to works published with his publisher's mark, have a look at this title page. The double V V weakest goeth to the double V all. The weakest goes to the wall. As it has been sundry played by the right honourable Earl of Oxenford, the Lord Great Chamberlain of England, his servants. Another play which uses this printer's mark is Mother Bombay, which has been attributed to John Lilly. The play has two pairs of changeling children and a servant by the name of Dromeo. It is different in style to his other plays. There has been some doubt about the attribution. John Lilly was employed as a secretary to Edward de Vere in 1579. Throughout the 1580s he acted as his theatre manager. Lily is closely connected to the children of St. Paul's Cathedral, which was forced to disband around 1590. As the play was sundry times played by the children of Paul's, it was written some time in the 1580s. It was during this time that Edward de Vere seems to have housed a team of writers at his house at Fisher's Folly. It would seem likely that Mother Bombay and the Comedy of Errors share a common source and use the same printer. Check out the comments section below for the Thomas Creed Connection by Robert Brazil. This title page has a note which says, See if Langbane assigns an author to this. Gerard Langbane wrote an account of the English dramatic poets, published in 1681. He was one of the first people to write about William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. He says, The truth, agreed by most, that his learning was not extraordinary. Then, in an apparent contradiction, Langbain talks about the author's skill in French and Italian, with Italian proverbs scattered up and down his writings. Act 3, Scene 1, where Antiphilus of Ephesus is locked out of his house, seems to come from Plautus' play, Amphitruro, in which Jupiter disguises himself as Amphitryon and sleeps with Amphitryon's wife, resulting in the birth of Hercules. The character of Amelia the Abbess is taken from Apollonius of Tyre, which was also a source for his play Twelfth Night, as was Glingani of 1549, an Italian play which I discussed in the video Twelfth Night in Context. Aegean's Tale, translated into modern English by ChatGPT. I was born in Syracuse and married to a woman who would have been happy if it weren't for me. If fate had not been cruel, we would have lived in joy together. I had made a lot of money through pro prosperous voyages to Epidanium until my factor died and I had to take care of the goods that were left behind. This drew me away from my loving wife's embrace, who had made arrangements to follow me soon after my departure. She arrived safely with me and soon gave birth to two sons who looked so alike that they could only be distinguished by their names. At the same inn where my wife gave birth, a poor woman gave birth to twin boys who looked exactly alike. Since their parents were very poor, I bought and raised them to serve my own sons. My wife was very proud of our two sons and constantly urged us to return home. Reluctantly, I agreed and we set sail. We not sailed far from Epidamium before we encountered a violent storm that nearly killed us. Despite the fact that I was ready to embrace death, my wife's tears and the children's cries forced me to seek any means to delay our fate. The sailors abandoned our sinking ship and sought safety in our boat. My wife, concerned for our youngest son, his son, 
tied him to a spare mast, while one of the other twins was tied to him. I took care of the remaining twin. We held on to either end of the mast and were carried towards Corinth by the current. Eventually, the sun dispersed the clouds and the seas calmed down. We saw two ships approaching us, one from Corinth and the other from Epidaurus. But before they reached us, we were hit by a huge rock that split our ship in two. Fortune had left us with equal measures of joy and sorrow. My wife and our two sons were rescued by fishermen from Corinth. Another ship rescued me. They were slow in pursuing the fishermen, who had taken my wife and sons, and therefore the fishermen managed to escape. My youngest son, but the one I care for most, at 18 years old became curious about his brother and begged me that his attendant, who was in a similar situation having lost his brother but still retaining his name, might accompany him in his search for him. While I was laboring to see my beloved son, I risked losing the one I still had. I spent five summers traveling through Greece and journeyed through the entirety of Asia, then returned to Ephesus on my way back home hopeless of finding him, but unwilling to stop searching anywhere that might have men who knew of him. But here my life story must end, and I would be happy to die now, if all my travels could assure me that they are alive. The performance of Menikmi in 1527 coincides with the time that Henry VIII was seeking an annulment with Catherine of Aragon which was the start of the Protestant Reformation in England. Prior to this time, most theatre was in the form of mystery plays, which were often performed on religious feast days. Also popular were morality plays, which featured allegorical characters representing abstract concepts such as good deeds, faith, hope, charity, death, sin and the devil. The characters in morality plays were often engaged in a struggle between good and evil, with the plot revolving around the moral choices and actions of the characters, and the consequences of these choices. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth, many plays which contained Catholic messaging were outlawed along with other papish practices. The tradition of watching plays on feast days continued. At the time Shakespeare was writing, audiences would have been attuned to the Christian messaging in the plays. They would have been familiar with the Apostle Paul's travels around the Mediterranean, visiting the places mentioned in the play, reminding them of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 22 Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, as husbands love your wives, as though they are part of your body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Adriana expresses this idea in Act 2, Scene 2 as that undividable incorporate. Ephesians 6, 5 Slaves obey your earthly masters, serve them wholeheartedly, and masters treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them. The confusion in this play is caused by misidentification. The error is caused by mistrust, jealousy, selfishness, and harsh judgment. Resolution is brought through faith, love, selflessness, and mercy. It is the father Aegean who, for the love of his children, has faith to search for his lost child, even risking death. He has been condemned to die and accepts this death in the hope that his sons would be happily reunited. Emilia, the abbess, says, Thirty-three years have I but gone in travail of you, my sons, and till this present hour my heavy burden ne'er delivered. This doesn't fit the timeline previously given in the play, but is an allusion to Jesus, who was thirty-three when he died on the cross. Shakespeare created a new name for his twins, Antiphilus. In centres, the sea and a comedy of errors, Charles Garton suggests that the name Antiphilus could be after the Latin name Antiphila, a girl who expresses mutual love in Terence's Latin play, which translates as the self-tormentor. This play also has the character of Dromo the slave, or the author might have been thinking of the word Antipolius, which means adverse towns. The twins have grown up in the adverse towns of Syracuse and Ephesus, and have a mutual love and yearning to reunite. Although there was no one in history named Antiphilus, there was a centaur named Pholus. 
In Greek mythology, Pholus was a centaur, unlike other centaurs, who was savage and unruly. Pholus was thoughtful and generous. He befriended Hercules when he came looking for Dionysus' wine. Pholus gave Hercules the wine, and offered to cook him a meal. The other centaurs, who were notorious for their drunkenness, smelled the wine and came to Pholus' cave to demand their share. A fight broke out between the, between the centaurs and Hercules, during which Pholus accidentally wounded himself with one of Hercules' poisoned arrows. Despite Hercules' attempts to save him, Pholus died from the wound. There is an element of hospitality in the play when Antiphilus of Syracuse invites Balthazar to dine with him, only to find the door barred. Adriana claims to have been poisoned by Antiphilus' adultery, whilst Antiphilus claims to have been poisoned by her jealousy. Although no one is killed, there is general unrest in the town of Ephesus. Ovid also the centaur Pholus, and adverse towns in his Metamorphosis. Also in this story is Theseus, the son of Aegeus. The centaur is the name of the inn where Antiphilus of Syracuse has secured lodging. From Vir Virgil, Aeneas presents Sergestus, the captain of the ship the centaur, with his promised reward. Glad that the ship is saved and the crew brought back, a slave woman is given him, not unskilled in manoeuvres tasks. Folo, of Cretan stock, with twin boys at her breast. Minerva, of course, is the spear-shaking Roman goddess of wisdom, justice, law, victory, and patron of the arts. In an epigram by John Davis of Hereford, Shakespeare was called Our Englishans. He says, Thou hadst been companion for a king, suggesting that he was a courtier. The Duke of Ephesus was named after Salinus, a Latin writer and grammarian, whose work, Polyhistor, was translated by Edward de Vere's uncle, Arthur Golding. Amelia may have been named after Amelia Peer, from Castiglione's book, The Courtier. Amelia is a charming woman, who was known for her feminine grace, possessing intelligence and good judgment. The book was translated into Latin from the Italian by Bartholomew Clark and contains a commendatory epistle in Latin by the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. The character Balthazar may have been named for Balthazar Castiglione. Adriana is the queen who was said to have founded Venice after fleeing from Attila the Hun. Adriana is the jealous wife of Antiphilus of Syracuse, who is accused of being a dissembling harlot. She could represent De Vere's wife, Anne Cecil, who complained to her father, William Cecil, that her husband would not come home to her, because he was spending too much time with the Queen, whilst her husband accused her of having a child that wasn't his. Much like the story of Amphit Rural, there is evidence that Anne Cecil, who was said to have a pure and chaste character, had sent for abortives, and that her husband knew of this before he left for the continent. Rumours that Anne's child was not de Vere's continued after his return, leading to a five-year split. Angelo, the gold merchant, may have been named after Giovanni Battista Agnello, who was employed to assay the ore brought home by the Frobisher expedition that Edward de Vere had heavily invested in. Shakespeare has Dr. Pinch, who is described as a schoolmaster, come in to try and cure Antiphilus of madness by putting him and Dromio in a darkened room. In Twelfth Night, Malvolio was put into a dark room when he was told he was mad. Aristotle said, No great mind has ever existed without a touch of madness. Writers Virginia Woolf, Edgar Allan Poe and Sylvia Plath are well known for having experienced symptoms of bipolar disorder. Artist Vincent van Gogh had several episodes of mania and depression. We could spe speculate that such a great mind as the writer Shakespeare had a touch of madness. Edward de Vere 
was documented to have had bouts of mania. He also sent letters to say that his illness prevented him from making an appearance at court. Descriptions of his character and the letters and poems that he wrote suggest that he had bipolar disorder. The evidence for this is provided in the book Shaky's Madness by Robert Boog. Or listen to the podcast Don't Quill the Messenger from the 31st of March 2021. Dr Pinch says, It is no shame. The fellow finds his vein, and yielding to him humours well his frenzy. An obvious double meaning here. Dr Pinch is alluding to the cleric temperament of Antiphilus of Ephesus. Earlier, Dromeo of Syracuse warns Antiphilus of eating dry meat, lest it make him choleric. Even though the concept of the humours influencing behaviour dates before 500 BC, it was the writings of Galen who popularised the theory that good health was determined by the humours being in balance. Blood, as humour, was considered hot and wet. This gave it a correspondence to spring and a sanguine temperament. Yellow bile was considered hot and dry, which related to the summer, described as choleric. Black bile was considered cold and dry, related to autumn, given the melancholic. Finally, phlegm, cold and wet, was related to winter, phlegmatic. Galen also suggested that although the humours were produced in the body, they could also be influenced by food. No, sir, I think the meat wants that I have. In good time, sir, what is that? Basting. Well, sir, then twill be dry. If it be, sir, I pray you eat none of it. Your reason? Lest it make you choleric, and purchase me another dry basting. Well, sir, learn to jest in good time. This is a time for all things. I durst have denied that before you were so choleric. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2 talks about foolishness under the sun. Then the header for chapter 3 in Edward de Vere's Geneva Bible, which is available at the Folger Digital Collection, is Time for All Things. To all things there is an appointed time, or sometimes translated as all things have their season. From the Latin Vulgate Old Testament Bible, Omnia Tempest Habet. Shakespeare cleverly plays with the idea of the seasons, foolishness under the sun, hot and dry choleric temper. Then he takes the Greek word for time, chronos, to refer to old father time. Then we are transported back to the inns of court. Romeo sets out to prove by reasoning that there is not a time for all things. He equates the loss of time to the loss of hair. There is no time for a man to recover his hair that grows bald by nature. Antiphilus argues that, but your reason was not substantial why there was no time to recover. Dromio replies, Time himself is bald, and therefore, to the world's end, will have bald followers. Antiphilus answers, I knew it would be a bold conclusion. This seemingly trivial dialogue reads like a legal discourse. The punchline would have found a safe landing in the inns of court. The theme of time continues with the entrance of Adriana, thinking that Antiphilus of Syracuse is her own husband, Antiphilus of Ephesus. Looking at her strangely begins, The time was once... She then enters into a long diatribe about how their relationship has changed over time. Antiphilus of Ephesus replies, Plead you to me, fair dame, I know you not. In Ephesus I am but two hours old. I feel that by listening to that long rant by Adriana, we have grown a couple of hours older. Let's compare these two poems. They use a device called anadiplosis where the end of one line is repeated at the beginning of the next. The first poem. What plague is greater than the grief of mind, the grief of mind that eats in every vein, in every vein that leaves such clots behind, such clots behind as breed such bitter pain, so bitter pain that none shall ever find. 
What plague is greater than the grief of mind? And the second, She is so hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach. You have no stomach, having broke your fast. But we that know what is to fast and pray are penitent for your default today. The phrase at the end of each line is repeated at the beginning of the next, creating a connection between them. The first poem is written in iambic pentameter. The second does not strictly follow iambic pentameter. Both end with a rhyming couplet. The first was attributed to Edward de Vere. But were they both written by the same person? In this, the shortest and earliest of plays, Shakespeare demonstrates his knowledge of law, medicine, Latin drama, the Bible, history and geography. Even the earliest commentators on Shakespeare wonder at his ability with French, Italian and Latin, which is in contrast with Will of Stratford's recorded education. Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, possessed the education, the life experience and the poetic skills required to write these plays. Thank you for watching the Comedy of Errors in Context. I hope that you've learned something new. Before tackling a new play, I will be doing a round-up of the four plays that we have looked at already. It's not possible to cover every detail in each play, but I will be picking up on any important points that may have been missed. I will also be discussing common themes. I will leave a link to my sources below. Please don't forget to like and press the bell icon to be informed when the next video is uploaded. I would love to hear any suggestions or questions about the four plays discussed already in the comment section below. And remember, please be kind.